Part 3. Marius had preserved the religious habits of his childhood. One Sunday, he had gone to hear Mass at Saint-Sulpice, at the same chapel of the Virgin, to which his aunt took him when he was a little boy. And being that day more absent-minded and dreamy than usual, he took his place behind a pillar and knelt down, without noticing it, before a Utrecht velvet chair, on the back of which this name was written, Monsieur Mabeuf, Churchwarden. The Mass had hardly commenced, when an old man presented himself and said to Marius, Monsieur, this is my place. Marius looked, moved away readily, and the old man took his chair. After Mass, Marius remained absorbed in thought a few steps distant. The old man approached him and said, I beg your pardon, monsieur, for having disturbed you a little while ago, and for disturbing you again now. But you have thought of me impertinent, and I must explain myself. Monsieur, said Marius, it is unnecessary. Yes, resumed the old man. I do not wish you to have a bad opinion of me. You see, I think a great deal of that place. It seems to me that the mass is better there. Why? I will tell you. To that place I have seen for ten years, regularly, every two or three months, a poor brave father come, who had no other opportunity and no other way of seeing his child, being prevented through some family arrangements. He came at the hour when he knew his son was brought to mass. The little one never suspected that his father was here. He did not even know, perhaps, that he had a father, the innocent boy. The father, for his part, kept behind a pillar, so that nobody should see him. He looked at this child and wept. This poor man worshipped this little boy. I saw that. This place has become sanctified, as it were, for me, and I have acquired the habit of coming here to hear Mass. I prefer it to the bench where I have right as warden. I was even acquainted slightly with this unfortunate gentleman. He had a father-in-law, a rich aunt, relatives, I do not remember exactly, who threatened to disinherit the child if he, the father, should see him. He had sacrificed himself, that his son might some day be rich and happy. They were separated by political opinions. Certainly I approve of political opinions, but there are people who do not know where to stop. Bless me. Because a man was at Waterloo, he is not a monster. A father is not separated from his child for that. He was one of Bonaparte's colonels. He is dead, I believe. He lived at Renon, where my brother is curé, and his name is something like Pont-Marie, Mont-Percy. He had a handsome sabre cut. Pont-Mercy, said Marius, turning pale. Exactly. Pont-Mercy. Did you know him? Monsieur, said Marius, he was my father. The old churchwarden clasped his hands and exclaimed, Ah, you are the child, yes, that is it. He ought to be a man now. Well, poor child, you can say that you had a father who loved you well. Marius offered his arm to the old man and walked with him to his house. Next day he said to Monsieur Gillemont, We've arranged a hunting party with a few friends. Will you permit me to be absent for three days? Four, answered the grandfather. Go amuse yourself. And with a wink, he whispered to his daughter, Some love affair. Part 4 Marius went to Venon and spent several hours at his father's grave. Then he returned to Paris, went straight to the library of the law school, and asked for the file of the Moniteur. He read the Moniteur. He read all the histories of the Republic and the Empire, the Memorial de saint Hélène, all the memoirs, journals, bulletins, proclamations. He devoured everything. The first time he met his father's name in the bulletins of the Grand Army, he had a fever for a whole week. He went to see the generals under whom George Pontmercy had served, among others. Count H. The churchwarden, Mabeuf, whom he had gone to see again, gave him an account of the life at Vernon, the colonel's retreat, his flowers, and his sol solitude. Marius came to understand fully this rare, sublime, and gentle man, this sort of lion lamb who was his father. In the meantime, Engrossed in this study, which took up all his time, as well as all his thoughts, he hardly saw the Ginormand. At the hour of meals, he appeared. Then, when they looked for him, he was gone. The aunt grumbled. The grandfather smiled. Oh, well, it is the age for the lasses. Sometimes the old man added, The devil! I thought it was some gallantry. It seems to be a passion. It was a passion, indeed. 
Marius was on the way to adoration for his father. At the same time, an extraordinary change took place in his ideas. The, places, the phases of this change were numerous and gradual. As this is the history of many minds of our time, we deem it useful to follow these phases step by step and to indicate them all. The history on which he had now cast his eyes startled him. The first effect was bewilderment. The Republic, the Empire, had been to him, till then, nothing but monstrous words. The Republic, a guillotine in twilight. The Empire, a sabre in the night. He had looked into them, and there, where he had expected to find only a chaos of darkness, he had seen with a sort of outstanding uh, surprise, mingled with fear and joy, the uh, stars shining, Mirabeau, Virginot, Saint-Just, Robespierre, Camille de Moulin, Danton, and a sun rising, Napoleon. He knew not where he was. He recoiled, blinded by the splendours. Little by little, the astonishment passed away. He accustomed himself to this radiance. He looked upon acts without dizziness. He examined personages without error. The revolution and the empire set themselves in luminous perspective before his straining eyes. He saw each of these two groups of events and men arrange themselves into two enormous facts. The republic into the sovereignty of the civic right restored to the masses. The empire into the sovereignty of the French idea imposed upon Europe. He saw spring out of the revolution the grand figures of the people, and out of the empire the grand figure of France. He declared to himself that all that had been good. He was full of regret and remorse, and he thought with despair of all that he had in his soul he could now only say, only say to a tomb. Oh, if his father were living, if he had had him still, if God in his mercy and in his goodness had permitted that his father might still be alive, how he would have run, how he would have plunged headlong, how he would have cried to his father, Father, I am here, it is I. My heart is the same as yours, I am your son. How he would have embraced his white head, wet his hair with his tears, gazed upon his scar, pressed his hands, worshipped his garments, kissed his feet. Oh, why had this father died so soon, before the adolescence, before the justice, before the love of his son? Marius had a continual sob in his heart, which said at every moment, alas. At the same time, he became more truly serious more truly grave, surer of his faith and his thought. Gleams of the true came at every instant to complete his reasoning. It was like an interior growth. He felt a sort of natural aggrandizement to which these new things, his father and his country, brought to him. From the rehabilitation of his father, he had naturally passed to the rehabilitation of Napoleon. One night he was alone in his little room next to the roof. His candle was lighted. He was reading, leaning on his table by the open window. All manner of reveries came over him from the expanse of space and mingled with his thought. What a spectacle is night! We hear dull sounds, not knowing whence they come. We see Jupiter twelve hundred times larger than the earth, glistening like an ember. The welkin is black, the stars sparkle, it is terror-inspiring. He was reading the bulletins of the Grand Army, those heroic strophes written on the battlefield. He saw there at intervals his father's name, the Emperor's name everywhere, the whole of the Grand Empire appeared before him. He felt as if a tide were welling and rising within him. It seemed to him at moments that his father was passing by him like a breath and whispering in his ear. Gradually, he grew wandering. He thought he heard the drums, the cannon, the trumpets, the measured tread of the battalions, the dull and distant gallop of the cavalry. From time to time, he lifted his eyes to the sky and saw the colossal constellations shining in the limitless abysses. Then they fell back upon the book and saw there other colossal things moving about confusedly. His heart was full. He was transported, trembling, breathless. Suddenly, without himself knowing what moved him, or what he was obeying, he arose, stretched his arms out of the window, gazed fixedly into the gloom, the silence, the dark in infinite, the eternal immensity, and cried, Vive l'Empereur! From that moment it was all over. The Emperor had been to his father only the beloved captain, whom one admires and for whom one devotes himself. To Marius he was something more. He was the very incarnation of France, conquering Europe by the sword which he held, and the world by the light which he shed. Marius saw in Bonaparte the flashing spectre which will always rise upon the frontier, and which will guard the future. Despot, but dictator. Despot resulting from a republic and summing up a revolution. Napoleon became to him the people-man, as Jesus is the god-man.
All these revolutions were accomplished in him without suspicion of it in his family. When in this mysterious labor, he had entirely cast off his old Bourbon and ultra skin. When he has shed the aristocrat, the Jacobite and the royalist. When he was fully revolutionary, thoroughly dramatic and almost Republican. He went to an engraver on the Quai des Oeuvres and ordered a hundred cards bearing this name, Baron Marius Pontmercy. By a natural consequence, in proportion as he drew nearer to his father, his memory, and for the things that the colonel had fought for 25 years, he drew off from his grandfather. As we have mentioned, for a long time, Monsieur Gillemont's capriciousness had been disagreeable to him. There was already between them all the distaste of a serious young man for a frivolous old man. So long as the same political opinions and the same ideas had been in common to them, Marius had met Monsieur Gillemont by means of them as if upon a bridge. When this bridge fell, the abyss appeared. And then, above all, Marius felt inexpressibly revolted when he thought that Monsieur Gillemont, from stupid motives, had pitilessly torn him from the colonel, thus depriving the father of the child and the child of the father. Through affection and veneration for his father, Marius had almost reached aversion for his grandfather. None of this, however, as we have said, was portrayed externally, only he was more and more frigid, laconic at meals, and scarcely ever in the house. When his aunt scolded him for it, he was very mild, and gave as an excuse his studies, courts, examinations, dissertations, etc. The grandfather did not change his infallible diagnosis. In love, I understand it. Marius was absent for a while from time to time. Who can he go to? asked the aunt. On one of these journeys, which were always very short, he went to Montfermeil in obedience to the injunction which his father had left him, and sought for the former sergeant of Waterloo, the innkeeper Thenardier. Thenardier had failed, the inn was closed, and nobody knew what had become of him. While making these researches, Marius was away from the house for four days. Decidedly, said the grandfather, he is going astray. They thought they noticed he wore something upon his breast and under his shirt, hung from his neck by a black ribbon. Part 5 It was to Vernon that Marius had come the first time that he absented himself from Paris. It was here that he returned every time Monsieur Gillemont said, He sleeps out. One morning Marius, returning from Vernon, was set down at his grandfather's and, fatigued by the two nights passed in the diligence, feeling the need of making up for his lack of sleep by an hour at the swimming school, ran quickly up to his room took only enough time to, tail, to lay off his travelling coat and the black ribbon which he wore about his neck, and went away to the bath. Monsieur Gillemont, who had risen early like all old persons who are in good health, and heard him come in, ha hastened as fast as he could with his old legs to climb to the top of the stairs where Marius's room was, that he might embrace him, question him while embracing him, and find out something about where he came from. But the youth had taken less time to go down than the octogenarian to go up, and when Grandfather Gillemont entered the garret room, Marius was no longer there. The bed was not disturbed, and upon the bed were, dis were displayed without distrust the coat and the black ribbon. I like that better, said Monsieur Gillemont, and a moment afterward he entered the parlour where Mademoiselle Gillemont, the elder, was already seated, embroidering her cab wheels. The entrance was triumphal. Monsieur Gillemont held in one hand the coat, and in the other the neck ribbon, and cried, Victory! We are going to penetrate the mystery. We shall know the end of the end. We shall feel the libertinism of our trickster. Here we are with the romance even. I have the portrait. In fact, a black chagrin box, much like to a medallion, was fastened to the ribbon. The old man took this box and looked at it some time without opening it. Let us see, father, said the old maid. The box opened by pressing a spring. They found nothing in it but a piece of paper carefully folded. From the same to the same, said Monsieur Gillemont, bursting with laughter. I know what it is. It's a love letter. Ah, oh, then let us read it, said the aunt. And she put on her spectacles. They unfolded the paper and read this. For my son, the emperor made me a baron upon the battlefield of Waterloo. Since the restoration contests this title which I have bought with my blood, my son will take it and bear it. I need not say that he will be worthy of it. The feelings of the father and daughter cannot be described. They felt chilled as by the breath of a death's hand. They did not exchange a word. Monsieur Gillemont, however, said in a low voice, and as if talking to himself, It is the handwriting of that saberer. The aunt examined the paper, 
turned it on all sides, and put it back in the box. And just at that moment, a little oblong package wrapped in blue paper fell from a pocket of the coat. Mademoiselle Ginomont picked it up and unfolded the blue paper. Marius's hundred cards. She passed one of them to Monsieur Ginomont, who read, Baron Marius Pontmercy. The old man rang. Nicolette came. Monsieur Ginomont took the ribbon, the box, and the coat, threw them all on the floor in the middle of the parlour, and said, Take away those things. A full hour passed in complete silence. The old man and the old maid sat with their backs turned to one another, and were probably, each on their side, thinking over the same things. At the end of that hour, Aunt Ginemont said, Pretty. A few minutes afterwards, Marius made his appearance. He came in. Even before crossing the threshold of the parlour, he perceived his grandfather holding one of his cards in his hand, who, on seeing him, exclaimed with his crushing air of sneering bourgeois superiority, Stop, 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 stop! You are a baron now! I present you my compliments. What does this mean? Marius coloured slightly and answered, It means that I am my father's son. Monsieur Ginemont checked his laugh and said harshly, Your father? I am your father. My father, resumed Marius with downcast eyes and stern manner, was a humble and heroic man who served the Republic in France gloriously and who was great in the greatest history that men have ever made, who lived a quarter of a century in the camp, by day under grape and under walls, by night in the snow, in the mud and in the rain, who captured colours, who received twenty wounds, who died forgotten and abandoned, and who had but one fault, and that was loving too dearly two ingrates, his country and me. This was more than Monsieur Ginemont could listen to. At the word Republic he rose, or rather sprang to his feet. Every one of the words which Marius had pronounced had produced the effect upon the old royalist's face of a blast from a bellows upon a burning coal. From dark he had become red from red, purple, and from purple, glowing. Marius! exclaimed he. Abominable child! I don't know what your father was. I don't want to know. I know nothing about him, and I don't know him. But what I do know is there was never anything but miserable wretches among all that rabble. That they were all beggars, assassins, redcaps, thieves. I say all, I say all. I know nobody. I say all. Do you hear, Marius? Look you indeed, you are as much a baron as my slipper. They were all bandits who served Rospierre, all brigands who served Buono part, all traitors who betrayed, betrayed, betrayed the legitimate king, all cowards who ran from the Prussians and the English at Waterloo. That is what I know. If your father is among them, I don't know him. I am sorry for it, so much the worse your servant. In his turn, Marius now became the coal, and Monsieur Ginemont the bellows. Marius shuddered in every limb. He knew not what to do. His head burned. His father had been trodden underfoot and stamped upon his, in his presence. But by whom? His grandfather. How should he avenge the one without outraging the other? It was impossible for him to insult his grandfather, and it was equally impossible for him not to avenge his father. On the one hand, a sacred tomb, on the other, white hairs. He was for a few minutes dizzy and staggering with all this whirlwind in his head. Then he raised his eyes looked straight at his grandfather, and cried in a thundering voice, Down with the Bourbons, and the great hog Louis the Eighteenth! Louis the Eighteenth had been dead for four years, but it was all the same to Marius. The old man, scarlet as he was, suddenly became whiter than his hair. He turned toward a bust of the Duke de Berry, which stood upon the mantel, bowed to it profoundly with a sort of peculiar majesty. Then he walked twice, slowly and in silence, from the fireplace to the window, and from the window to the fireplace, traversing the whole length of the room, and making the floor crack as if an image of stone were working over it. The second time, he bent toward his daughter, who was enduring the shock with the stupor of an aged sheep, and said to her with a smile that was almost calm, A baron like monsieur, and a bourgeois like me, cannot remain under the same roof. And all at once, straightening up, pallid, trembling, terrible, his forehead swelling with the fearful radiance of anger, he stretched his arm toward Marius and cried to him, Be off! Marius left the house. The next day, Monsieur Ginemont said to his daughter, You will send sixty pistoles every six months to this blood drinker, and never speak of him to me again. Having an immense residuum of fury to expend, not knowing what to do with it, 
He spoke to his daughter with coldness for more than three months. Marius, for his part, went away without saying where he was going, and without knowing where he was going, with thirty francs, his watch, and a few clothes in a carpet bag. He hired a cabriolet by the hour, jumped in, and drove at random toward the Latin Quarter. What was Marius to do?